Disease Foundation. Their vision is to find cure for Crohn's disease. Mission is to offer patients hope and improvements as they wage a lifelong battle against Crohn's disease and blindness. Goals are to build awareness, raise funds, fund research, and build, and build patient resources. Now, it is a nonprofit foundation. It was established in 2006 by parents of Jack McGarner. It was our honor that actually Jack is here today with us in the audience, as well as his mother, Tina. Um, and they, as they promised really to find cure for disease, um, Coates disease. Now, it's only fitting that our inaugural um, keynote lecture, uh, Jack McGarren Code Disease Foundation um, keynote lecture is um, Mike Jumper, being that he has taken care of Jack. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mike. Um, his medical school training was at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. He did ophthalmology residence at the University of California in San Francisco, and we share passion for Blue, Blue Devils since he did his fellowship at Duke. Um, he then um, went on to do, do his chief service um, in uh, United States Air Force. He's currently a vice chairman, mitral retinal service um, chief, and mitral retinal surgery fellowship co-director at California Pacific Medical Center. He's a member of a West Coast Retina Medical Group in San Francisco. We um, know Mike from many appointments, and he's a um, pretty prominent role within the ASRS as a board of directors, and also editing and leading on some of the really well-known um, uh, publications, uh, such as Retina Times, as well as the Preference and Trends Survey. Um, he has published over 80 journal articles, chapters in peer-reviewed ophthalmology literature. He's given really numerous presentations and, and participated in many courses. He's on the editorial board for the ASRS Journal of Journal of Retinal Disease, and he has really served in many scientific reviewer as an, a reviewer for many um, journals. He has received many honors, um, senior honors from AO and ASRS, and he has been an outstanding teacher, and you can witness that by outstanding faculty awards uh, given by residents that he's thought. So without further ado, I would like for you to help me welcome our inaugural keynote lecturer for Jack McGarren Coates Disease Foundation. Um, Mike Jumper and his uh, talk will be on Coates Disease, Our Current State of Ignorance. Thank you, Mike. Well, it is uh, really an honor to be invited to speak here uh, and to be given this honor of being uh, uh, one of the keynote speakers. And um, I wanted to uh, share with you a passion that I developed when I first met Jack uh, with Coates disease and, uh, and tell you what we know and maybe what we don't know about Coates disease. I have no financial disclosures pertinent to this talk, but I will be talking about the off-label use of a lot of drugs. And when you're talking about a lot of drugs, it means not one works really well. So uh, that's one of the reasons. The uh, Coates Disease Foundation had its beginnings uh, almost a decade ago, when in 2010, the family, the McGovern family and the foundation sponsored a small retinal vascular disease meeting. You can see some of the familiar faces in the crowd that we met in San Francisco. We did it again two years later, and this meeting was in 2012. Uh, and uh, their dedication to education and getting people together and networking and learning uh, has been really tremendous. And I uh, very much appreciate that. And all my colleagues that uh, made it out uh, to uh, San Francisco for these meetings. And now here we are today, uh, this big meeting that uh, Emmy has put on, and they've been a part of that as well. It's been a, a great 10 years, really. And I, I didn't really appreciate the bottom-up uh, research efforts that are needed for rare diseases until I met the McGovern family. But it's a very important thing that either a solo investigator or a family or somebody with uh, a real vision starts working on a, a rare disease or other, else it won't get studied and it won't get cured. These are a couple of articles that highlight families much like the McGovern family uh, regarding this effort. I'm a clinician and I'm going to give you a bunch of cases and I'm going to throw some cases out to start with and I'm going to come back to those cases as we're hitting on points in Coates disease that I'd like to make. Uh, the first case is an 11 year old Asian boy who had progressive vision loss in his left eye for a month uh, and it was harder to see for him to see in the dark. He has a past medical history of asthma 
Uh, no family history, and his vision was counting fingers in this affected left eye. And you can see pretty amazing exudation throughout the uh, periphery and in the posterior pole. The second case is a two-year-old who had normal birth and development, developed a right exotropia, was discovered by mom. That right eye had poor vision, and on examination had a 3B uh, Coates-related retinal detachment. Now, just to refresh the memory of people, uh, this is the classification scheme that had been developed uh, over time and was finally kind of uh, elucidated by the Shields, uh, who have done so much in the, our understanding of Coates disease. And you can see here, 3B means a, a, a total retinal detachment. The third case is a 12-year-old boy who had vision loss in his left eye for three months, uh, no past medical or family uh, history, uh, and poor vision in this left eye that has peripheral telangiectasias and posterior pole uh, uh, exudation with uh, subretinal and intraretinal fluid. And then the fourth case, a five-year-old boy who looks very much the same with macular uh, exudation due to temporal uh, telangiectasia. Uh, his vision loss was discovered at a school screening. His vision's 2400. The last case is a patient who has distortion of vision, and he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis uh, and currently an in inactive uh, without therapy and was treated for Coates disease originally when he was 28 about, or 26 about five years ago, and now has good vision. The macula was never affected, uh, but now has some distortion associated with exudation that's temporal to the fovea. So the original Coates description, we were talking about this yesterday with x linked retina schesis, these, uh, these researchers that happened uh, in the early 20th century were quite good at identifying and characterizing and uh, showing what things look like without all the fancy equipment with, that we have. And Coates did a good job of uh, identifying this condition as being in young males, usually unilateral, congenital, not familial, and really not associated with any real systemic disease uniformly. But the question is uh, usually unilateral, still hold, um, and uh, is it really unilateral? Well, there's been some uh, studies that have been done by members of this audience, including Mike Blair and his co-workers that showed that there are vascular changes when you look with wide field angiography in the unaffected contralateral eye in some Coates patients. These are uh, in the form of telangiectasias and microaneurysms that rarely exudate and do not, uh, are not neovascular. Uh, and in a larger multi-center retrospective study looking at 175 Coates patients, they found that 19% uh, or so had uh, this contralateral finding, none of which progressed over time. Uh, going back to Coates' description, there are retinal vascular abnormalities, uh, which we all are aware of, associated with exudation, and this is, uh, has a tendency to accumulate in the posterior pole, and he also identified the lipid-laden macrophages uh, that are in the subretinal and intraretinal space. So uh, later on, uh, we've had some re uh, refining of the definition, and uh, the Shields, in one of their uh, named lectures, uh, proposed that, uh, that Coates be defined as idiopathic congenital retinal telangiectasia with intraretinal or subretinal exudation and without appreciable vitreoretinal retinal traction. Uh, and this was really trying to distinguish Coates disease from the many conditions that result in either retinal telangiectasia or exudation or both. So going back to case one, this is the 11-year-old who's had some difficulty seeing in the dark. Uh, his other eye is not normal. He has peripheral retinal changes, and uh, his visual field is abnormal in both eyes. Electrophysiology is also abnormal with abnormal photopic and scotopic ERG responses. So this is a child that has uh, retinitis pigmentosa uh, and has a Coates-like response. Now, there are systemic conditions that have a Coates-like phenotype, uh, including FSHD, senior locan, Turner syndrome and Alport syndrome, and then there are ocular conditions that also have a uh, Coates-like response as well. There's a little controversy in this. I think in some of these conditions it may be that they actually have a, a real Coates sort of phenotype, 
such as in Turner syndrome, uh, and we might learn something from these genetically abnormal conditions that we can somehow link up and try to sort of discover what's common between the retinitis pigmentosa or, say, uh, FSHD, that we can kind of better understand uh, the cause of Coats disease for which we don't at this point. Uh, there's an estimated incidence of 0 0.09 per 100,000 people. That was from a uh, study uh, by Morris in the UK. Uh, it's been diagnosed uh, at anywhere from one month to 79 years of age, but the median age of presentation is around five years when you look at tertiary care centers that are getting referrals, mainly to rule out retinoblastoma and other things, or eight years when you did the population-based study. There is an earlier age of present, when, when there is an earlier age of presentation, there's an increased disease severity and an accelerated progression. And this is almost its own entity, in my opinion. And uh, in an advanced coat series of uh, advanced coats patients, 40% presented uh, out or before the age of two. Uh, if you don't do anything about coats disease, it's not good. And so uh, total retinal detachment is common. Uh, neovascular glaucoma occurs in a third of patients without treatment, and uh, Hake reported that 80% of the untreated patients in his study developed tysis, neovascular glaucoma, or both. So the treatments that we have available to us uh, include ablative therapies, as you know, uh, drug, drug treatments, uh, intraocular surgery, or a combination of all of the above, which is uh, what uh, a lot of people end up doing some form of combination. Now, I'm, uh, as far as ablative therapy, I'm a big believer uh, in the results of this paper and the Baskin-Palmer experience, and that uh, repetitive, aggressive laser, I think, is a, oftentimes a, an, a good way to control the progression of Coates disease. In their study, they used a diode laser, uh, and their objective was to whiten the vascular abnormalities, even in detached retina, uh, and when the retina reattached, or in areas of reattached retina, you can scatter, uh, place scatter laser in the areas of ischemia. They, placed, uh, they did a medium number of four to five treatment sessions, and they applied the treatments about every two months. And they had very good anatomic outcomes, and this is what I feel has been uh, helpful in my practice, and I, I employ uh, much of the time. Uh, laser uh, has long-term good anatomic results with, uh, alone as a monotherapy. Uh, and we find that using intraoperative wide field angiography uh, can help identify uh, the extent of the disease in the areas of ischemia that may not be so easy to see on examination alone, which then I think reduces the retreatment rates. Uh, cryotherapy has been traditionally used for stage three and four disease. Uh, and it, uh, I think it still has some role, but I don't use it much. Uh, it may temporarily increase exudation, and I would just caution that people be careful when using it with combination of drug therapies. Uh, intraocular pharmacotherapies, uh, the rationale is that angiogenic and bioactive factors have been found in the fluids of Coates patients uh, and, and at higher levels than normal, uh, and you can see the list of the agents here. Uh, VEGF levels, uh, interestingly, are higher in uh, the pediatric Coates patients than adult Coates patients which may explain uh, this different phenomenon that you have in the younger patients with uh, greater uh, exudation and problems. Now, steroid therapy has been used uh, primarily intravitreal uh, triamcinolone has been studied uh, with mixed results uh, as a monotherapy, uh, and there have been a lot of complications reported when it's used in combination with cryotherapy. Uh, a study by Bergstrom uh, helped to uh, let us understand that, uh, they found elevated intraocular pressure in four or five of the patients that they treated uh, with, uh, with intraocular triamcinolone followed by cryotherapy some months later. Uh, there was severe cataract in three or five patients. And then even long-term, there was uh, development of traction and retinal detachment that was inoperable in three or five patients. So I would caution people to avoid the use of intraocular steroids and cryotherapy. Uh, intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy, I think, has a role. All, a lot of the different uh, drugs have been used. Uh, there's a temporary uh, reduction in exudation, and much like the treatment of uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy or other exudative uh, diseases that we deal with, it's not a cure, it's a, it's a temporary treatment. Um, and so an ablative therapy is often needed in conjunction or afterward. 
Uh, there have been uh, reports of improved vision, uh, but there have also been reports of in, uh, vitreoretinal fibrosis and progressive traction to detachment reported with the use of anti-VEGF therapy combined with ablative therapy, uh, therapy, especially cryotherapy. So again, cryotherapy and these intraocular drugs are something to be cautious about. Now, intraocular surgery for coats is usually reserved for stage three or greater disease. Uh, and it's been shown in this uh, series of a uh, large number of patients with shields that 17% of those patients ended up, 17% uh, of the eyes ended up needing uh, some form of intraocular surgery in their hands. The techniques go from anywhere from uh, placing an anterior chamber infusion uh, with drainage and then having the reattached retina using the reattached retina to ablate it with either laser or cryotherapy more often. Uh, but then uh, vitrectomy with all the different techniques that we uh, know to use uh, have been employed to try to get retinas reattached uh, with Coates uh, detachments. I'm sorry, th this is a, an example uh, in the literature from Stagna and his coworkers showing an anterior chamber uh, maintainer uh, placed with a 27 gauge uh, needle uh, that's poked through the sclera and through the choroid uh, to allow drainage of subretinal fluid as the anterior chamber maintainer is uh, maintaining pressure in the eye. So uh, colleagues in this room uh, have gotten together and put together a series of patients who uh, looking at long-term outcomes of stage 3B coats. Uh, you can see here this was 16 patients, uh, or 16 eyes of 16 patients with at least five years of follow-up, but it was very long follow-up with a mean of nine and a half years. The interventions were all of the above, including ablation in all of them. Uh, and then vitrectomy was performed in 12 eyes, eight of which had vitrectomy within the first year of diagnosis, and four of which had what they called late which was an uh, average or a mean of uh, three years after the diagnosis. The outcomes are, uh, are disappointing, uh, but, but what we see, what we see uh, with no light perception or light perception vision in eight eyes, uh, counting fingers vision to 2,200 2, and 25%. Uh, some of the patients had some vision uh, to begin with. Uh, there was neovascular glaucoma and tysis that developed in four eyes, but 15 of the 16 eyes were salvaged. There was a thought that perhaps uh, earlier vitrectomy, the group that received the vitrectomy earlier in the course, might have a better outcome uh, as there was less uh, vitreoretinal fibrosis and uh, less traction in those cases in the long run. Um, it just makes me think that this is a, a disease that we can't let get to the 3B stage. And so uh, we just have to um, figure out, I think, ways of screening babies and young uh, children uh, better than we are now. And I salute Darius Mashfegi and his coworkers who have uh, tried uh, screening tests and are proposing this, as I do think this is something that might uh, be a way for us to prevent uh, blindness from Coats disease in the future. Uh, so of all the causes of permanent vision loss in Coats disease, you know, unless we can get to this early, catch it, treat it, before the macula becomes involved. There's not, uh, a lot of these are very difficult to reverse. Uh, one though, I think is macular fibrosis where I think we have some hope. And that brings up case number three. And this is a 12 year old boy uh, who has poor vision with uh, st uh, like a stage 2B. You can see here before treatment, he has quite a bit of exudate in his macula uh, and uh, serous uh, detachment and some intraretinal edema. And three months after treatment, it's looking better uh, as far as the OCT is concerned, but uh, you can see there's increased exudation or, or increased lipid uh, uh, de deposition in the macula. The vision's improved somewhat. Three, three months uh, after that, now six months after the original treatment, something has changed in the macula. There was no leakage to begin with in the macular area, and now there is. Well, what's, what's gone on? It looks, you can see here, there's a fibrotic scar in the center of the macula. There's a pigmented spot in the center of the fibrotic scar. It looks like vessels are diving into that area where the pigment is. Uh, and this is all uh, centered in the area of the greatest uh, exudate deposition earlier. So what's happening angiography, with the angiography? You can see here, it looks like a retinal, retinal anastomosis has formed. 
and there looks to be abnormal blood vessels and choroidal neovascular uh, retinal angiomatous proliferation happening within the retina here and with, with leakage late. So we call this, or uh, it's been described as macular fibrosis in Coates disease. I looked at the, uh, the, the patients in our practice over the time our practice was in existence at the time, and 45, 47 patients who had adequate imaging were sort of looked at. And the conclusions were that this is very common in Coates disease, this macular fibrosis, that it occurs at the point of the exudate accumulation, and it's a neovascular process, and it portends a worse visual prognosis. So this is another example of a case in which we have neovascularization happening right in the center of the macula. And it turns out that of the 47 patients in our series, we had 23% or 11 eyes who developed this exact phenomenon. And it's always sort of at the area where the, most, where the exudate was most dense. Uh, there is usually uh, within and underneath the retina. And there's this intraretinal vascular anastomosis that had been identified in uh, seven of the 11 eyes. There was hyperpigmentation oftentimes at the point of anastomosis. And this is uh, something that was reported originally in 2010 and it's been uh, the, some other uh, uh, worker, co-workers or authors have, have found similar findings in their, in their Coates patients. And uh, Eric Sigler and um, Dr. Calzada both, uh, they found that uh, their rate was around the same as, our, as ours, 24% of the patients that they studied have the same macular fibrosis. Uh, the lower author, Darius, uh, has proposed that the presence of a subfovial nodule be included in the, uh, in the Coates cl classification that was proposed by Shields. So what is the pathophysiology of this fibrosis? Well, it seems that phospholipids are a stimulant for inflammation uh, that are there, and that this inflammation is a stimulant for angiogenesis. This is my sort of guess on all of this. Uh, this is uh, uh, Larry Yanuzzi's uh, uh, paper on retinal angiomatous proliferation, and I think the same sort of thing is happening here from the top down in our case. Uh, and you can see in our, our patient this area where the anastomosis is occurring, uh, much like a retinal angiomatous proliferation lesion. Now this is not <clears throat> isolated to uh, Coates disease, this can happen in any exudative process. This happens to be a patient uh, that Alberg had reported on uh, with von Hippel disease who developed macular fibrosis after a severe ex exudation. Uh, there's also macular fibrosis that can occur in diabetic retinopathy, and it's kind of interesting looking back at the ETDRS study that 1.8% of patients had uh, choroidal neovascularization or a neovascularization process happen during the course of the ETDRS. And it seemed that the extent of the heart exudate was the strongest uh, risk factor. At the time, they proposed that this had something to do with the laser treatment, that the laser was creating choroidal neovascularization in these patients. But 34 of the eyes, 34 of those 109 eyes who had this uh, process had not had any laser. They were in the control arm. And of those patients who were treated with laser, 92% did not have the choroidal neovascularization kind of associated with the actual laser mark. So it's, uh, I think this is a, a case where the exudation is creating neovascularization. Well, uh, in more recent diabetic uh, research, they have been looking at the effects of anti-VEGF therapy on retinal heart exudate in diabetic macular edema. And in the exploratory analysis on RIDE and RISE study patients, monthly intravitreal ranibizumab resulted in significantly greater reduction in heart exudate as compared to sham. And uh, in contrast to the rapid decrease in uh, edema, this was a much slower process uh, reduction in the heart exudate. But it, it gives me hope that maybe there's something that we can do to reduce the heart exudate, which is the nidus, in my opinion, of the neovascular process. Well, this brings up case four. So I've already dealt with case three. He came and went. But now I've got case four in front of me, and he's got just as much exudate in his macula as case three. And so, <clears throat> um, uh, and just as much uh, subretinal fluid and all. So um, what I did on this patient was begin anti-angiogenesis injection therapy during the course of the exudate resolution, which usually happens uh, that I've seen over several months. 
uh, and usually requires about five injections about every six weeks to sort of get through that period. And you can see here, as the exudate is uh, going away after six weeks and then 23 weeks and then 32 weeks after, uh, and then <clears throat> we get into six years and seven years, there is a reduction in the uh, kind of fibrotic but not re complete resolution of the kind of, of a nodule underneath the retina, but it does not appear, at least uh, clinically, to be as far along and as bad as what happened uh, without treatment, but I um, am completely uh, open to this, not, this being just the natural history and that I didn't do any good with the anti-VEGF injection therapy, but I'm hoping that we are doing something to help, um, help these patients' eyes. And he, this patient, had a, a, a good outcome. You can see here um, not a big scar and no uh, retinal retinal anastomosis that I can see on examination of this patient now almost eight years later. This is another example of a patient who received five bevacizumab injections over about six months. Uh, no, I'm, or I'm sorry, about a, over about eight months. And this is a picture taken at one year uh, after initiating therapy. So the, inter the other interesting thing about this kid, this kid has an unaffected twin, ident identical twin brother. So it sure would be nice to get genetic analysis on this uh, patient and his family, and we did. And so this just is a segue into uh, the genetics of Coates, which uh, I don't have any answers for you, but I'm intrigued, as most of you all are as well. Uh, it all started with me with a paper that was by Grant, uh, Black and his coworkers uh, out of England who found that uh, they, they happened upon a, a patient who uh, was, had Coates, a woman who had Coates disease and a Coates phenotype, who gave birth to a child with Nori disease. And then in looking back at the genetics, it found out <clears throat> that her mother uh, had an NDP mutation. She was a carrier. So then uh, they then looked at archival Coates uh, tissue from their tissue bank of, of Coates disease patients. And they found that one of those nine, they could find an NDP mutation, a somatic mutation in some of the tissue. It was present in the, in the ocular tissue, but in the retinal tissue, but not in non-retinal tissue in this eye that they studied. So maybe there was sampling problems and they couldn't find it in others. Maybe there was a sampling problem and they found it where they shouldn't. I don't know, but th it's intriguing that we're talking about the possibility of a somatic mutation. I think it's much more complicated than this, uh, but it started uh, the whole idea of genetics, in, in my mind at least. So <clears throat> there has been developed a Coates disease registry, and this is a <clears throat> multi-center effort, and thanks very much to the efforts of Emmy and uh, uh, Drs. Lee, Rekia. Uh, we have partnered with the Jack McGovern Coates Disease Foundation and Genentech <clears throat> and have performed whole exome sequencing and we've gotten data on 61 unrelated probands uh, and 112 first degree relatives. Uh, and we have complete trio data on 26 families at this point. And this is what we're working very hard to get kind of <clears throat> mother, father proband uh, data on more of these patients. And uh, the collection has yet to be completed, but we're very excited that we now have uh, one of the largest uh, whole exome databases for Coates disease that we hopefully will learn something from uh, here in the future. <clears throat> All right, case five is our 32-year-old man who at age 26, five years previously, had uh, been treated for Coates disease and has new distortion but good vision. And these are uh, images from five years earlier in which there is some uh, mild exudation uh, in the superior temporal periphery. But when you look, um, and this is not easy to see, but on the, uh, on the screen uh, left, there is the original area, which then turns out to have uh, the new Coates lesions and exudation uh, later, now five years later. It's not very impressive. You wouldn't uh, have treated it back then, and I don't see much in the way of leakage at that time. Uh, there's another example of a patient I saw just uh, a couple, three months ago and retreated is a young boy who has, again, uh, he was treated in 2011 and now here, uh, going on eight years later, he has in an area where you can see on angiography by the arrow, 
really not much going on that turns into be a real exudative component there. So late recurrence in Coats disease uh, after initially complete therapy has been described in up to 7% of Coates patients and the mean time to recurrence is as long as 10 years. So that's why we need to keep following these patients and that we've got to uh, remind our patients that they need to keep being watched because there is a chance of a late recurrence. So in conclusion, our cause remains unknown for Coates disease. Uh, the vision loss is too common and we did definitely need more effective screening, and it's going to be the people in this room that will make that happen. Uh, we need further study uh, to prevent this macular fibrosis, and uh, I'm excited about the possibility of uh, pharmacotherapies to do so. Uh, that macular fibrosis is a neovascular process uh, and fairly common, uh, with a and it's, I think, potentially a way of preventing vision loss in patients with Coats disease. And I think that the phospholipids uh, may have something to do with, with promoting this inflammation and angiogenesis. It seems that peripheral ablation of abnormal vessels and ischemic retina is the main form of therapy still. Uh, Laser is effective and even in detached retina uh, and multiple sessions may be required if you do that. Uh, and I'd say be cautious when using cryotherapy. And coats can recur in a previously normal appearing part of the retina so long-term follow-up is needed. Now I want to give special case, uh, thanks to uh, Emmy Layla and Cindy, uh, this has been a wonderful course and you know, I can tell it's really been uh, a, a big part of your life for the last uh, year and a half or so and I know that uh, it's really been a tremendous success. I also want to thank the Jack McGovern Coats Disease Foundation, including the McGovern family, Deborah Marin, uh, and the board. Uh, and I want to point out to the, to the people in the audience that there's a website, uh, CoatsDiseaseFoundation.org, and there's a couple things that I'd like to direct you to on the website. Number one is that there's a place uh, in which you can sort of uh, identify yourself uh, as somebody that takes care of Coates patients for those who are on this website. And this website is in, indeed frequently visited by patients and families. And then also uh, there's a patient registry that I would encourage your patients to consider being a part of. As this uh, <clears throat> genetic efforts get going further, that would be a good way for us to recruit patients. So thank you very much for your attention. Yes, time for questions. Yes, sir. Hi, Mike. It's uh, Armin Harper. Hey, Armin. Mike, um, they did a big study in England looking at a, it's a twin study on coats, and um, they didn't find any genetic association between the twins. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, so there have been some, some genetic studies looking because there's some sort of candidate genes that uh, were, um, um, you, people were looking for. Uh, and even in the, the wind si signaling pathway, there has been nothing really uh, shown uh, to date that indicates this is a genetic problem, at least uh, a, a um, germline genetic problem. I still hold hope that there's got to be some uh, sort of downstream uh, uh, thing that's helping with the maintenance of vessels in general. And I do think that, you know, uh, Genentech has taken this, uh, this project on and done, you know, a lot of uh, whole genome sequencing. Uh, and I think that they're doing so because they have a hunch that, you know, vascular maintenance, uh, we could learn something from this little disease about vascular maintenance that might pertain to diabetes or other vascular diseases. Nina. May I ask you? Oh, question? I'm sorry, yes. Here. <laughs> I'm Dr. Ozek from here, with the moderator site. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was looking hard. That's okay. <laughs> uh, you have shown uh, a very nice case with uh, anti-VEGF, where you don't have any nodule. You, nodule didn't happen, I mean, it didn't form with just anti-VEGF injections, is that correct? Well, they were, they were treated with ablative therapy in the periphery, but they were treated with anti-VEGF. Together? Acid. Well, yes. I mean, the ablative therapy I think of as being the thing that stops the peripheral exudation. Mm -hmm. And the anti-VEGF, what I think of is that the idea is to keep the, that exudate from turning into neovascularization in the posterior mm -hmm. pole. Uh, 
I have not seen great results with anti-VEGF in causing sort of exudation to dry mm -hmm. up without laser, mm -hmm. but uh, that's, that was my idea. So that was just five injections or you continue to... It was, to it was five injections done over about a six or seven month period in mm -hmm. a, you know, uh, done every, about every six weeks. And I feel so uh, when, when you do it, when you combine the injections with the laser, it helps, but it's difficult, you know, for the children to give injections under ex uh, anesthesia. So that's why I'm concerned how many you did. Thank you. Yes. So Mike, great. Mike, great, yes. great talk. Oh, Over thank here. you, yeah, Nina. Yes, great talk. But you know, the most interesting patient I have with Coates is a 70-year-old um, guy now who came to me. I follow him for 20 years, and in those 20 years, he pops little areas of telangiectasia that we treat with laser, and he also had um, a slight vitreous hemorrhage when he had a PVD, but throughout 20 years, it's been great to follow him because angiographically, he just pops little areas that we treat. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's something that makes no sense to me. I don't, I don't get it, so, yeah. nasal retina. So I think, um, I'll repeat that, um, for, for cases of uh, late recurrence, what I've tended to see is under treatment of the nasal retina, for the tensions on the temporal retina. I think that um, using ultra wide field, uh, either ret cam or optos imaging to try to identify all those vascular changes and, and um, nuking anything that looks even slightly abnormal um, gives the best chance at avoiding late recurrences. I agree. I agree with that. That you know you can get late recurrences from in de novo areas, but you can also get uh, you can get what he's saying. I think is just progression in a sort of quiescent area that had vascular changes to begin with, and if you you really do have to look for those. Yeah, and it keeps that VEGF drive going, maybe, Mike. You know, this disease and familial exudative vitreous retinopathy when it gets ahead of you. You got actually, I think, are the perfect examples of that penisotonic leakage that I mentioned in my talk. And what you were just saying about the VEGF, anti VEGF therapy didn't seem to add that much. It's kind of instinctive that with this type of leakage, we would think anti VEGF therapy would be something to do because we think of anti VEGF therapy and control of leakage. But this is a perfect example of why normal healing fails to treat really severe leakage. It's a really, really fantastic demonstration. Yep. Layla. It was just a beautiful lecture. Thank you. Very informative, very interesting, intriguing um, questions. Um, we recently did an institutional review of all our cases, um, Coast disease and kind of treatment over the period and over the decades in terms of how our management has changed and very much along the lines of what you've talked about. Um, but we also did kind of some indices of OCT findings, what we can see in codes. And it was interesting to find out in cases where they show beautiful exudation, intraretinal and subretinal, we found out just like in mimics in diabetes and other disorders, that intraretinal exudation typically does not limit visual acuity down the road. But subretinal definitely tends to clump like you showed and potentially creates a nodule. But I think your case very well illustrates potential use of anti-VEGF to limit the nodule uh, formation or at least vascularization of it. I think in that particular case, it looks like the, the, the kind of fibrosis did form, but luckily a little more in perifovial locations versus right. subfovial. Now, your question, the question for you is any pointers how to decrease the amount of subretinal excitation as, as it takes place as we're treating? Because sometimes we find out that treatment actually provokes it, and what are your pointers to limit that? Um, because that's actually, at the end, the limiting factor in visual acuity benefit. Yeah, I, so the, <clears throat> I think that the exudation when you see it increase like we did in the, the third case, the exudation was there, it's just now falling out of solution. And so it does increase uh, the amount of exudate which you see that's present. And when it falls out of solution like that, uh, I, I don't know that there's anything more that can be done. There's been talk uh, that I don't believe, uh, maybe others could comment on this, <laughs> that perhaps if you laser uh, somewhere out uh, uh, in just a, a posterior to where the actual uh, vascular changes are, that you might decrease that migration of exudation. But I don't know that, I, I don't believe that. Uh, another thing that has been shown uh, that Golan Payman, who is such a, a 
fantastic mind. Um, he has done actual subretinal surgery to remove exudate in Coates patients, uh, but I don't think that that's that wise either. Um. Mike, Mike that's, that was a terrific talk. Um, you know, I, I, when, I, when you showed the uh, images of the, where there was vascular, where, where there was a recurrence, and then you went back and you said, this is where it was, and yes. we were all like, oh, my gosh, I wouldn't have seen that or treated it. You know, as, as the resolution in, in some of our imaging improves, right, or the ability to see better, whatever the optics are, we might be able to pick up things like that earlier. I, I, I agree. I think that OCT angiography could be a very good way of picking these up. When we get swept source, more wide field OCT angiography, we're probably going to see a lot more things. And I think just like uh, Mike has pointed out and taught me about fever, uh, this lapel area, you know, you can see that in Coates disease where you have, you know, you know, there are vessels going through it, but there's nothing feeding the retina right there. And uh, to me, I think that that's an area that may be uh, driving further exudation that we have to pay attention to and do something about, maybe give Norigen, TM. And Mike, you said you give um, six injections, so at what point is your decision to stop? Well, uh, you know, your... it's, it's a very easy endpoint. It's when the exudate, when I feel the exudate is cleared enough that it's not going to turn into neovascularization. And that's a, I mean, it, 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 a lot of exudation has to go away, you know, but I, I, I feel like I, over time with uh, Coates disease, I've gotten a, a feel for how much exudate it takes to create this fibrotic scar. And um, so if, if it starts breaking up and thinning out, <clears throat> I feel like you're in pretty good space. Hi, Edward Wood, Royal Oak, Michigan. Dr. Jumper, great talk. One thing I was thinking about for your twins is it could be interesting to look at epigenetic sequencing in addition to whole exome sequencing. I can yes. provide some good information. I think we have, I actually have two, two, uh, two um, twin boys uh, which are affected both identical. And so that is one of the things that we're working on with the uh, Genentech and the uh, Jack McGovern Coast Disease people. Yes. I have a question here. I have to admit I'm not a Coates expert, but I would like to ask you, when you're talking about the um, macular fibrosis, what histological evidence are there that there's actual fibroblasts involvement and I ask that mainly because the imagery that you've shown is um, I guess it reminds me of the processes that we our lab has been doing some work which we haven't reported at this stage but we've been looking at Drusen formation in infants like from a, um, a series from um, I guess an eye bank series mm -hmm. and we've seen Drusen's from age nine years onwards and I guess I'm trying to differentiate the pathogenic genetic process in Coates disease between um, and the, the separation that, and the uh, exudate deposition underneath the RPE and then the uh, choroidal neovascularization. It's, it's reminiscent to me of possibly a slightly different, um, like as the RPE separates, you've lost the, I guess, the digestion that that RPE role of um, uh, digesting the photoreceptor outer segments. So I'm trying to sort of think about the pathogenetic processes in terms of slightly different to, you know I'm an angiogenesis person, so I love that mechanism, but I guess I'm also asking you in terms of um, Drusen formation and the separation of the RPE and, and how that affects the deposition that you're seeing in coats. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the, the, the separation of the retina and the retinal pigment epithelium uh, shouldn't be enough of a drive in itself to create neovascularization in this situation. Um, we have people with central serous retinopathy and have, uh, you know, separation for months that don't get this kind of a complication. I really think that the, the phospholipids sort of between the retina and the pigment epithelium have something to do with this. We know that that recruits uh, macrophages, uh, and we know that macrophages uh, are, have an angiogenic component. Um, so I'm not sure if I am following your question other than what I just said. I, no, I, I actually do agree with you. And part of the Drusen contents that we're seeing is that there are lots of um, 
um, fatty lipid sure. as well as the macrophages. So I guess that th there is an overlap in the pathogenetic processes. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I, I think you might be right. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you Thank very you. much. That was fabulous.